The story of Atlantis has intrigued humanity for millennia. It has confounded the experts and brought wonderment to the general public. Ever since Plato described in great detail the history and demise of that Atlantean empire in his writings of Critias and Timaeus from around 400 BC. So if the story is real history, why and when did the Atlantean Empire crumble? And why have we heard so few details about this dominant economic and military force of the ancient world? Were the ancient Atlanteans star mappers and earth mappers back in the Ice Age, as some historians suggest? Did Atlanteans have the capacity for space travel? And did they disappear through some vortex-like wormhole? Or were they destroyed by some galactic upheaval, as some mythologists suggest? Does the story of Atlantis even confirm some biblical accounts of the book of Genesis? This documentary explores the newly discovered, down-to-earth findings of several offshore sites now considered to be a part of the ancient Atlantean Empire, and considers their implications for the timing of when Atlantis was consumed by the sea. These findings also show that this ancient civilization founded by the legendary figure Atlas must have had highly advanced and accurate mapping methods which enabled these Atlanteans to successfully measure and map the Earth, thereby allowing them the ability to navigate to far-flung locations throughout the world, representing an empire of global proportions that was wiped out at the end of the Ice Age. I absolutely do think that the story of Atlantis fits into real history. Uh, and, and just to put that in, in context, if we, if we look at what mainstream scholars uh, regard as the recent history of the Earth, everybody is agreed that there was an event called the Last Ice Age, and that the Last Ice Age came to an end rather cataclysmically about 12,000 years ago. And the story of Atlantis, if we go back to the original source of the story of Atlantis, the earliest surviving source to have come down to us is the Greek philosopher Plato. And Plato, who of course knew nothing about Ice Ages, nevertheless set the demise of Atlantis precisely at the time that the vast ice sheets that covered huge areas of the Earth were melting down and pouring their meltwater into the oceans and raising sea levels by 400 feet all around the world. There are over 200 known sunken cities in the Mediterranean. And the idea that there's over 200 sunken cities in the Mediterranean is indicative that the whole Atlantic and the Mediterranean were flooded in some kind of catastrophe. These ruins are associated often with Atlantis. There's a certain type of polygonal megalithic construction that's very uh, distinct. And you see this in these ruins that are still above water, but you see the same kind of construction in these underwater ruins too. Here there are two dolmens. Menge is the biggest in the world. It's 5,000 years old and it's for the burial chamber too. We think that they buried 500 people inside of the dolmen of Menge. And the stone at the end, on top, is the biggest used in a prehistory monument from all the world too. The weight of this stone is 180 tons. megalithic building with gigantic sculpted stones is considered by almost all the experts to have begun around 2500 BC. From the Great Pyramid of Giza, to Stonehenge in England, to Bayalbek of the ancient Canaanites, and even to the dolmens and citadels of southern Spain. The dolmen of Viera, this is the dolmen of Viera, uh, this dolmen is 4,500 years old and it's for the burial chamber, like a tomb, prehistory tomb. In this dolmen you have two clearly different parts, the long corridor and at the end it has a chamber for the burial. Within it's only for one person or one family, probably for the chief of the village that live here. 
and this is the only one of the three one of Antequera that is in the line of the summer solstice. One day of a year, the sunlight is coming through all the dolmen until the end of the chamber, 23rd of June. All across the southern plain of Spain are these megalithic dolmens, uh, Hormazo buildings, and they are at the base of what later would be built upon the structures by the Romans. They were the base structures at Nibla, Ronda at southern Spain, which were on rivers in the mountainous areas of the Sierra Morena Mountains, which is the richest mining area, the most ancient and richest mining area in the entire world. Now this was the source of the wealth for the Atlanteans. They would bring this copper ore and tin ore and silver ore and gold ore down the rivers to Seville, and that was the Atlantean Plain. One form of megalithic construction that is found all over the world is known as cyclopean. And cyclopean construction is giant granite or some other stone, boulders, that have been shaped and are usually fitted together in, in a jigsaw pattern where they, the stones are perfectly fitted and locked in together. We can find it in Spain, we can find it in Greece, in Turkey, uh, in the Middle East. Uh, we can even find it in, in Mexico and other areas. And the similarity of this unusual type of construction, in my mind, is evidence of a, a singular source for this construction method, and I believe that is Atlantis. So off the coast of southern Spain are submerged megaliths in like f at least five sites. Off of Lixus, Morocco, west of Gibraltar. Off of Tarifa, which is right near Gibraltar. Off of Huelva, Rota, and Chipiona. Submerged megaliths in 50 to 100 feet of water, which are of the megalithic, uh, well-hewn rock forms, walls, citadels, paving stones for streets, the whole bit, discovered at these four locations offshore. Submerged when the Ice Age ended. The capital city of Atlantis was a canal city with concentric canals and rings leading in to an inner city and, and port area. And Plato describes the city of Atlantis very uh, specifically this way. The city of Carthage built in Tunisia by the Phoenicians was in many ways a miniature model of the capital city of Atlantis with also these concentric circles and canals leading to an inner city. In many ways, uh, Carthage was a, a rebuilding of the ancient capital of Atlantis. Carthage, in the ancient language, is pronounced Kart Hadash, and that means new city. So it was a copy of the old city, Atlantis, somewhere near in the Gibraltar area. It was a direct copy of Atlantis. Now, the common not, or thought process is that Atlantis went under about 10,000 years ago and that Carthage was built around 1000 BC. So the ancients waited 9,000 years to make the new city, the replica, the copy of Atlantis. They waited 8,000, 9,000 years to do that, to replicate it. Seems very doubtful to me. Another thing that a lot of your Atlantean researchers will point to is the cross of Atlantis, is the symbol of Atlantis derived from Plato's description of the, of the, of the central city of Atlantis. And the cross of Atlantis shows three concentric rings with a cross in the center with a canal emerging from the cross. And this is, again, thought to be a description of the, the, the central city of Atlantis. But what I've noticed is that when you look at the cross of Atlantis with the two-dimensional image of the concentric rings, symbolically a two-dimensional image of the concentric rings represents a three-dimensional experience. The 2D concentric rings represents a three-dimensional vortex. And, and nobody seems to talk about Atlantis as being a vortex or a gateway that leads into other realms. But that's exactly what I think it was. I believe that Atlantis was a maritime civilization. 
and I believe it was based on coastlines and that it was globally distributed. I think it was all over the world. I think it was virtually everywhere, but it was on coastlines. And the reason that so little evidence that historians will accept have come down to us is because those coastlines were all submerged and are now under 100 feet of water since the end of the last ice age and nobody has looked there. So I think actually the, the influence of a great lost civilization is to be found all around the world and I think one of the places in which it was very active uh, was in the Mediterranean and in the eastern side of what we now call the Atlantic Ocean. If I were looking for Atlantis, again, although I've spent my life doing that, I would make a beeline for Spain. <clears throat> and I would go toward Gibraltar and, Gibraltar and Tangier in Africa, because that's where Plato said Atlantis was. Anyone who reads Plato's dialogues knows that Atlantis lay beyond the gates of Hercules, one of which is Gibraltar, one of which is Tangier. Uh, the extent of Atlantis uh, as described by Plato, is outside and inside the Pillars of Hercules. So that obviously is not just an island. It was a coastline. Plato said that it extended from the Gibraltar east all the way to the Tyranian Sea, which is Italy, and to, to Libya, and to the west, all outside of the Pillars of Hercules, along the coastlines, all along uh, northwest Africa, as well as southwestern Spain. So it was not just an island. The main city of Poseidon was submerged, and it may be one of these three uh, now off the coast of southern Spain, at Tarifa, Huelva, Chipiona, and Rota. These Atlanteans were savvy ancient mappers whose leader, the legendary Atlas, has always been associated with sophisticated mapping. Atlas and his fleets were well known in the ancient world as successful navigators and mappers of vast expanses of oceans and their coastlines for trade and military conquest. They used a little known ancient method with which they could sail away and successfully find their way back to their base ports presumably in the Gibraltar area near the Atlas Mountains of Morocco and the rich mining districts of southern Spain. You go to Egypt and you go to the so-called Solar Boat Museum. Here is a boat built for Khufu, supposedly builder of the Great Pyramid, 2500 BC. It's as advanced as anything up to and maybe even including the clipper ships. This boat could go anywhere and if people had knowledge of the stars and it is now becoming quite clear that they did have knowledge of the stars. So if they knew navigation in a boat of this sort, you could get anywhere, America, Australia, any place. The earliest ocean going ships such as Khufu's ship were built in this time frame when old kingdom Egypt began to flourish around 2500 BC. The Phoenicians of Canaan, world-renowned navigators, were also beginning to build their ships at this time. Even the ancient Greeks began to build huge trireme ships mentioned by Plato in his epic account of the warfare between the Atlanteans and the Greeks, the dominant maritime empires at this time. These ancient shipbuilding civilizations are now considered to have easily been able to navigate and exploit the lands on both sides of the Atlantic with guidance from Atlas's mapping method. According to the ancient Aztec legends, the original homeland of the Aztecs was a mysterious and lost land called Atlan. And the word Atlan is in fact part of the word Atlantis. So the idea too that the Aztecs mysterious homeland that they left was somehow in Spain, uh, off the coast of Spain, uh, perhaps even the Basque areas of Spain, I think is, is a theory that deserves uh, some thinking about. Whenever the archaeologists get to work digging up ancient ruins, it's very often that something for example, the Mayan temples, as they keep digging, they find that, okay, the current temples are built, let's say, 800, 900 AD, but they dig down deeper and deeper and they're finding things 2000, 3000 BC. The most ancient structures of Central America from the ancient Olmecs and the pre-Mayans are from around 2 to 3000 BC, megalithic cyclopean structures. The Dutch in that area of Western Europe 
call a submerged lost civilization in their lore, Atlond. So we see this term ATL, Atlantic Atlon, uh, from the Mayans all the way across to Europe. So it seems to be a common seafaring culture at around 2000 BC. Yes, this is a, this is a very interesting uh, point, is the, 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 the references that we find from, from Central America to a place called Atlan, which seemed to be the, the home civilization from which the later historical civilization of Central uh, America sprang. Uh, it is, it, it's impossible to resist the connection between those references to a lost land called Atlan uh, and uh, to Plato's notion of Atlantis. And then there's the work of Barry Fell back in the 70s America BC that makes it quite clear, at least back as far as the Phoenicians, but maybe further back than that, they were routinely visiting the New World. Again, uh, in uh, academia that I often like to call quackademia, um, this is considered illegitimate to even suggest that these ancient people were capable of, of intercourse with each other in terms of trade or commerce or whatever. These ancient ruins of southern Mexico, later built upon by the Mayans, were cyclopean megalithic structures and are strikingly similar to those ancient structures of Lixus on the Atlantic coast of Morocco, as well as those of southern Spain, the region generally considered to have been the home base of the Atlantean Empire. This region includes the Basque country of Spain, whose people not only claim a lineage from the Atlanteans, but also refer to their lost kingdom as Atlantica. Interesting too, along those lines, that the Basque language, which is very unique, is also a very similar language to the Aztec language known as the Huatl. Both the Basque language and the Aztec language has a very curious combination of X sounds and ATL sounds, Atl, Quatl, Kakakakal. So when you have this Aztec language and the Basque language compared, we find a lot of curious similarities. The suffix atl, spelled A-T-L, found at the end of some Mexican words, means water. And the ancient Mexican homeland is said to have been atlan, across the water to the eastern Atlantic. So the connection to an Atlantean civilization is unavoidable. These Atlanteans quite obviously had the navigating savvy to get the job done with a little known ancient mapping method which allowed the surprisingly accurate mapping of many parts of the world in ancient times, even during the Ice Age. And very interestingly, there's a whole category of maps produced between the 15th and the 17th century based on lost sources which show the world with astonishing accuracy as it looked during the last ice age. I'll give you an example of this. Off the west coast of Ireland, uh, you can find on maps from the 15th century, a little circular island appears, which they call High Brazil. Such an island did not exist in the 15th, 16th and 17th centuries of our era. But if you reconstruct the coastlines of the world as they looked when sea level was much lower as it was during the last ice age, you find that an island was exposed above sea level in exactly the place that is indicated on those maps. How did they know it was there unless somebody was there to, to, to map it? The Sea King maps show accurate east-west distances, and that requires a knowledge, an accurate knowledge of time. You have to measure time to get that. Now, they didn't have clocks back then. They didn't have timepieces at 2000, 3000 BC, so they had to have another mechanism by which they could measure time. And that mechanism is the slow wobble of the Earth's axis, which would cycle once in 25,920 years. And with this rate, of the wobble of the Earth's axis, the constellations of the zodiac appear to move along the horizon. They knew this rate, therefore they could measure time and therefore measure east-west distances. For example, in Western times, the longitude was only developed and discovered, or let's say made precise. I think it's somewhere in the 17, in the 1700, 1750 or something of that nature. But there's 
increasing evidence that the ancients understood this full well. Moreover, what, where the evidence really gets commanding is when it becomes clear that the Egyptians had measured the earth because those, the understanding of those measures is what gives rise to the ancient me measuring system of cubits. And this is, again, universal. Well, the references to, to units of measurement is the measurement that is expressed in the Great Pyramid. I think actually that the, that the ancient Egyptian cubit is likely to turn out to be what is called an earth commensurate measure, that, that it is derived from an ancient system of measuring based on the knowledge of the, earth, of the dimensions of the earth. The circumference of the Earth is 21,600 nautical miles. And the base perimeter length of the Great Pyramid is half a nautical mile. So the circumference of the Earth is 43,200 base perimeter lengths. So it's an Earth commensurate measurement. And the royal cubit was derived by subdividing that half nautical mile. Now, the base perimeter of the uh, Great Pyramid is 440 royal cubits per base side. There's four sides, so multiply 440 by 4 and you get 1,760. Now, you divide 1,760 into half a nautical mile and you get your 20.632 inches. So it's an earth commensurate measurement. There's, there's no doubt whatsoever that the Great Pyramid of Egypt does embody the dimensions of the Earth. If you take the measurement of the base perimeter of the Great Pyramid, go along and measure each of its four sides and add that together, and then you multiply that number by 43,200, you will get a very accurate rendition of the equatorial circumference of the Earth to within a few miles of the, the value that we have today. If you take the height of the Great Pyramid and multiply it by the same number, 43,200, you will get a very accurate rendition of the polar radius of the Earth, in other words, of the distance from the center of the Earth to the North Pole. Um, now this is, uh, th this is really quite, quite remarkable. The Earth and night sky were viewed as a sphere within a sphere by several ancient civilizations. In the ancient book of the Mexicans, the Popol View, it is written that the ancients could measure the round face of the earth and the arch of the sky. Even Plato referred to the earth as a sphere within the celestial sphere. As a result of the slow wobble over the earth's axis, the sphere of the night sky appears to move at a constant rate of 72 years per one degree, known as precession. These Atlantean star mappers were apparently able to predict where on Earth the constellations of the night sky would appear at the same position, relative to the horizon. So, with this knowledge, the ancients related time to distance, the same principle upon which is based our modern nautical mile system, with arc minutes and arc seconds. Uh, the notion or the knowledge of precession of the equinox, that's another matter that's becoming better and better established almost by the day that the ancients knew about procession of the equinoxes way back when and write it into their legends and mythologies. Procession of the equinox is also known as lunisolar procession, is the gravitational pull of the moon and the sun on the Earth's equator, causing a wobble, a little like a falling top if you like. I think that um, they were able to measure the rate of procession with the instrument that I've rediscovered. And so, yes, I do think so, and I think that they created what was known as the Great Year, which is in, in, in many cultures, 25,920 years, which is once one roll of the procession, if you like, one orbit of the procession. And um, that they broke them down into 12, and 12 is the zodiac signs, and each of those is 2,160 years long. It appears that the ancients did have a method of understanding the earth in a different way than we do today. A good example is, is Plato's remark that if you could see the true earth from afar, it would appear as a 12-angle pyramid, as a 12-patched leather ball is the way he described it. And so you, you get this picture that they had this incredible consciousness. They had a, a highly advanced degree of consciousness that was not earth-based. 
Much of their knowledge was based upon a viewpoint of the earth looking at it from the outside in. Uh, some have said that extraterrestrials had to have given the ancients the knowledge that the earth is round, that the earth is a sphere, but ancient literature is replete that the earth is round. And this precession methodology proves that the ancients knew it was a sphere. They based their measuring on the fact that it is a sphere, and all this breakdown of these precession measures are a function of this knowledge that the earth is a sphere. No need for extraterrestrials to be passing this knowledge down to the ancients. The duration of the 12 zodiac ages, 2,160 years each, is one twelfth of the amount of time that it would take for the Earth to wobble once as it spins and revolves around the Sun, totaling 25,920 years. So the ancients, including the Egyptians and Atlanteans, were clearly able to measure the Earth by measuring the apparent movement of the constellations across the night sky. Recent research by several authorities has also revealed that the Earth's dimensions are embodied in the dimensions of the Great Pyramid of Giza, which experts now consider was used as the ancient prime meridian, as indicated on several ancient maps. It's certainly the only instrument that I've got that I can show to you is three arc minutes. And three arc minutes would allow anybody observing the procession of the equinoxes to figure out the rate of movement within a period of nine years of observation. Accuracy of three arc minutes is accuracy to within 0.5%. This level of accuracy is, not coincidentally, the same level of accuracy achieved in surveying the half nautical mile base perimeter length of the Great Pyramid of Giza. These structural measurements of the Great Pyramid is an almost perfect reduction of the dimensions of the Earth by a factor of 43,200. The Great Pyramid was almost certainly the embodiment of this very precise ancient precession mapping technique, and it was the base reference point for mapping the ancient world. Today, Greenwich, England is the base reference point for timekeeping, and also nautical mile mapping, which is based upon the relationship of time to distance as was the ancient system based at Giza in Egypt that was derived from procession time keeping. I think the evidence really is from the Dead Sea Scrolls as the Essenes um, measured the lunar calendar. But if you go back to Egypt, then obviously we talk about Thoth, Thoth meaning wisdom. Um, and he was also god of the moon. So we can see that he involved himself in weights and measures and writing and language and all of those things and it also says he involved himself in the moon. So measurement of the moon is uh, the only instrument, is the only body in the sky that's retrograde at a, a rate that's measurable by the eye. Plato says that Atlantis went under 9,000 years before his time, which would put it at around 10,000 BC. However, in the ancient world, the lunar calendar was very popular. The lunar calendar was their day-to-day -day, uh, calendar. Now, Plato received this story about Atlantis through four layers of oral renderings initially from Egypt. So during those four renderings, the translation could have been lost. Did they mean lunar calendar or solar calendar? Now the evidence does fit the lunar calendar rendering, 9,000 lunar cycles before his time, which would put the Atlantis within historical times. So this to me makes much more sense. Also, to navigate the world, they had a incredible knowledge of the stars of geography. In 1902, they found uh, in a Greek shipwreck uh, a device called the Antikythera mechanism. And today it is in uh, the Archaeological Museum in Athens, Greece. It was years of study that they found that this device had cogged wheels with hundreds of interconnected um, machines and it was a very intricate device, uh, literally a computer that dialed up the stars and was used for very sophisticated navigation. 
This Antikythera mechanism had many bronze gears, which replicated the various cycles of the sun, moon, planets, and stars in their cohesive movements. Therefore, this device could realistically predict their future positions. This mechanism had two concentric scales on the front, one for the Greek solar cycle and the other for the Egyptian lunar-based Sothic cycle. It is therefore altogether possible that the solar or lunar cycles of Plato's 9,000 so-called years back to Atlantis could have been confused before the story even got to Plato. Also, according to Plato's accounts, the Greek kings Erechtheus, Cecrops, and Erechthonius ruled at roughly the same time as the destruction of Atlantis. These kings are commonly thought by historians of ancient Greece to have ruled around 1,500 BC, certainly not 10,000 BC. So 9,000 lunar cycles before Plato's time more logically fits the timeline of his accounts, while 9,000 solar cycles does not. I don't think that Plato made anything up. I, I take Plato extremely seriously. And I think since our historians take Plato seriously in almost everything else he says, we ought to take him seriously on the issue of Atlantis. And uh, if you take apart what Plato is saying, he's talking about a great global civilization which had a strong influence in the Mediterranean area. Plato didn't know about the Ice Age, but he did know that a great flood took place at that time. To my mind, that adds a great deal of credibility to everything that he said. With the conventional date proposed by mainstream scientists for the end of the Ice Age at 10,000 BC, Greece would have been about 8,000 years away from the reigns of these three kings, and huge trireme ships of the Atlantis story appear 8,000 years later, at around 2000 BC. These conflicts in Plato's accounts cannot be resolved satisfactorily by mainstream academicians, and such conflicts and dating cannot explain the cyclopean megalithic structures that were submerged at the end of the Ice Age. Plato's descriptions of the Atlantean Empire were so detailed that they are reflected even in biblical references. Southern Spain is also called the Hesperides. They were daughters of Atlas and granddaughters of Poseidon, Atlas's father. As Poseidon means Father Sidon, and as Sidon was a son of Canaan, we see that the Atlantean people first came from the eastern Mediterranean, from the land of Canaan, a port city of which was Sidon. Cadiz, a city in southern Spain where an offshore site was located, was named after another son of Poseidon, Gadez. So the tie-in of these so-called mythological Atlantean characters with biblical accounts is now becoming apparent to ancient historians. Southern Spain is known as the, the Hesperides. They were daughters of Atlas, a supposedly mythological figure, but Atlas was the man of maps. He was this precession measurer who measured and mapped the earth, among others with him, the Atlanteans. And their base of operations was Tarshish, the biblical Tarshish. The Spaniards today know that Seville, that, which was anciently known as Tartessus, Previous to that was known as Tharsin or Tharsis. That's the Tarshish of the Bible, the great merchants of southern Spain. This area also known as the Hesperides. These were the Phoenicians, the same as the Atlanteans, circa 2000 BC. Phoenician sailors were under pain of death to keep the trade routes secret, particularly the trade routes that went out into the Atlantic. Their trade routes went to Spain, up to France, and to Cornwall, where the tin and copper trade was flourishing. What the Phoenicians did was try to keep their trade routes a secret, and so they fostered these ideas that the Atlantic was impassable to other ships, so that only their ships would have the courage and the knowledge to go beyond the Straits of Hercules into the Atlantic. 
Plato also elaborates on the gold, copper, silver, and tin mines of the Sierra Morena Mountains of southern Spain, which were by far the richest in the ancient world. It is presumed that they were the lifeblood of the Atlantean shipping empire with its mineral wealth, and these Atlanteans clearly had the ability to transport these minerals to the eastern Mediterranean to trade with the Greeks, Minoans, Canaanites, and Egyptians. So it would seem that the Atlanteans of about 2000 BC were truly the dominant shipping and military power in the western Mediterranean and eastern Atlantic. Their empire most likely ranged from Gibraltar in the west, northward to the rich tin mines of Cornwall, England, where are found the now submerged sites referred to as Avalon, and eastward from Gibraltar to as far as Italy and Libya. The almost identical Cyclopean megalithic ruins found in those regions, both onshore and now submerged, support and confirm Plato's account. I feel that what actually happened was that these people had a, a land which was bounded by the sea as opposed to bounded by the land. That they followed the trade routes of the trade wind, trade wind routes as we know them today and the local Atlantic currents and they travelled around the basin of the Atlantic Ocean. And so they existed on the peripheries of France, of Britain, of Scandinavia, and then down the coasts of Spain, round the north coasts of Africa, across from the Cape Verde Islands to Canaries, to the northern parts of America, the Caribbean, and back round the route again up from Newfoundland. As evidenced by the submerged megalithic ruins found in various parts of the world, some of which are on the shallow seafloor of the Gibraltar region, off Spain at Tarifa, Chipiona, Rota, Huelva, as well as off Lixis, Morocco, it is only now becoming clear that the tremendous sea level rise at the end of the Ice Age consumed the coastline portions of these ancient civilizations, preeminent among them being these port and citadel structures of the Atlantean Empire. One of the mysteries of ancient Egypt is the invasion of the sea peoples who fought major naval battles with the Egyptians during the New Kingdom. Who these sea people were, where they came from, is one of the great mysteries of history. It would seem that the sea peoples, in fact, came out of northern Europe. They were coming out of Denmark, of northern Germany, uh, areas of Holland, that were to go underwater. These sea people apparently began to migrate from their homelands along the shores of the Eastern Atlantic and the Western Mediterranean at a time that would coincide with the end of the Ice Age. Their own ports and coastal cities were being submerged when many experts now claim that the sea level rose at a rate of three feet per year for about 100 years, and tsunamis from the volcanic eruptions of Mount Etna and Santorini were surging onto the disappearing coastlines. These areas of the world were being flooded, and the, the sea peoples themselves then migrated in boats through the Straits of Hercules into the Mediterranean, where they battled the Egyptians, and the Egyptians won that battle and defeated the Sea Peoples. This is a major turning point in Egyptian history. And the Sea Peoples then settled uh, near to Egypt, but more around Greece, Turkey, and Lebanon. Even Egypt was affected by the end of the Ice Age. Where are the submerged megalithic ruins of the ancient Egyptian port cities known as Heraklion and Manuthis near Alexandria? Manuthis, the namesake of that now submerged Egyptian megalithic city, was another son of Poseidon, as reported by Plato. According to ancient biblical legend, Sidon, known as Poseidon, which means Father Sidon, a son of Canaan, and his progeny, Atlas and Manuthis among them, were building port cities from Sidon, Canaan, across the coast of North Africa, and all the way to Gibraltar and beyond. They were building their maritime trade empire with the ancient mapping knowledge of Atlas, the map man, who could measure and thereby map the earth with the dimensions of the Great Pyramid of Giza being the reduced embodiment of the dimensions of the earth. There are a number of scholars who contended that the, that the Great Pyramid is a, is a scale model of the Earth. And the earliest of those 
is a Greek. I'm not sure if it's Herodotus or Agatharsites, uh, one of the ancient Greeks who mentioned that because it was that that had Isaac Newton send his colleague John Greaves down to Egypt to try and figure out if there was anything to that old legend. The base perimeter length of the Great Pyramid is almost precisely one half a nautical mile, which is a reduction of the perimeter length of the Earth by a factor of 43,200, clearly indicating that the ancient Egyptians built the pyramid with that connection in mind. The dimensions of the Earth can only be measured by measuring time, which allows the measurement of longitudes, which are measurements of east-west distances. Because the ancient Egyptians didn't have accurate clocks to measure east-west distances, they needed a different timekeeping standard, which they apparently identified as the rate of the movement of the constellations along the horizon, resulting from the slow wobble of the Earth's axis. And then you see the rate of, um, of the procession of the equinoxes, 25,920. All of these simple things show that these people were measuring the size of their horizon, if you like, meaning time zone, related to themselves and to the stars as an exponential form of, of, of measurement. It's just a matter of rolling a wheel and converting the distance of a circumference into a straight line. The very interesting, in truth, um, the Great Pyramid, because I can teach a child how to design a Great Pyramid instantly with the cross. Well, within three minutes, let's be fair, if a child of five can produce a perfect pyramid every time with simple geometry. By triangulating where the constellations would appear in the future, according to their measured apparent rate of movement of 72 years per one degree, the ancients could pinpoint their location anywhere on Earth to within a 0.5% accuracy. So many distinct cultures and civilizations from different parts of the world integrated precession mapping numbers such as 12, 36, 54, 72, 108, and 432 into their respective ancient legends and architectures, indicating the scope of their knowledge and understanding of the Earth and stars. The, the Hindus, the Chinese, everybody had, had accurate and very advanced measuring systems based upon knowledge of the dimensions of the Earth. This is now quite formal, the, the evidence over the course of a number of books by various scholars, many of them independent of each other, pretty well demonstrates that this was known. And this is another thorn in the side of, of academia because if they have, if they know longitude, it means that they have an advanced and sophisticated science at their fingertips. Some of the maps of the Ice Age Sea Kings show mapping reference points radiating from the area of the Upper Nile Delta, where the Great Pyramid is located. This indicates that the ancient prime meridian, the base reference point for the ancient navigators, extended through the location of the Great Pyramid of Giza. So it would seem that the Egyptians were not only master builders, but also adept navigators, like the Canaanite Phoenicians, some of whom were the Atlanteans. The, the maps themselves testify to uh, an ancient project to uh, completely map the whole world. In order to map the whole world, you need big ships, which are capable of uh, enormous journeys uh, to actually visit all of these places around the world. And these maps show the world in great detail as it looked during the last ice age, not in the Middle Ages, and these maps incorporate uh, extremely accurate longitude relationships. In the Middle Ages, uh, a number of maps did exist of the Atlantic, and they often showed across the Atlantic a mysterious land known as Antilla, or the Antilles. And this area was associated with Atlantis. Uh, St. Brendan, other seafarers were known to go out into the Atlantic in search of this mysterious island of the Antilles. Later, uh, historians and cartographers identified the Antilles with many of the Caribbean islands. Uh, and in fact, they're called the Antilles today. The Greek philosopher Aristotle called the Phoenicians the Antilhas, who called themselves the Cana Anu, which means offspring of Canaan. 
So, according to the biblical timeline, these ancient world navigators were operating as the Atlantean Empire during the Ice Age, which according to conventional ancient historians ended around 10,000 BC, but which now appears to have ended closer to 1,500 BC. This time frame also coincides with the exodus of the Hebrews out of Egypt, when the sea level was rising due to the melting of Ice Age ice packs and the Middle East, Egypt, and the Indus Valley of India were drying out with the end of the Ice Age, causing the mass migration of people groups. Among them, the Sea People, who were the displaced Atlanteans as their civilization was being destroyed. The way the technology, the Atlantean technology was lost is inferred by Plato. And he describes how they had a divine essence within them. And that over time, this divine essence diminished. And when Zeus heard about this from his home in the center of the universe, as Plato describes, he sent his wrath. But if we extrapolate from that story and assume that even the center of the universe, by that he meant the center of the Milky Way galaxy, we do know that periodically galaxies go into what are called their active galactic nucleus phase, where they sprout out just these incredible cosmic energies. And there is evidence, according to some theoretical physicists and others, that Earth did suffer such a cataclysm. So I would go along with the idea that that was what actually caused the destruction of Atlantis, was this cyclical cataclysmic destruction and literally destroyed the civilization of Atlantis. Almost all would agree that Atlantis did succumb to the sea because of the end of the ice age, when the polar ice caps melted and the water poured into the sea rapidly, raising sea level and submerging all these megalithic structures which are now on the shallow sea floor. It's not because of some heat pulse from outer space, it's because the oceans had cooled to uh, the point where that evaporation was not so great, so the dense cloud cover was no more, so the ice age ended, sea level rose. That's hydrology 101. Paradoxically, warmer ocean waters is the only way you can explain the dense cloud cover for the ice age. So, were there really 8,000 years of missing history between the time that mainstream historians say the Ice Age ended at 10,000 BC and when they say this sophisticated megalithic building began onshore and presumably offshore as well at around 2,000 BC? If so, what was going on during those 8,000 years? And why did the ancients wait 8,000 years before resuming their megalithic building and advanced navigation of the Earth? Particularly as we discover more and more megalithic cities underwater, we're amassing better proof of this ancient civilization we'll call Atlantis. These cities just were not built underwater. They had to be built before these oceanic level changes. So whenever that was, uh, that is, you know, at least how ancient we can start to date these cities. And that is putting us back into this time frame of Atlantis. Plato, a world-renowned scholar, you know, people look to him as a source of truth and knowledge. Now, was Plato misinformed when he was told 9,000 solar years apparent before his time for Atlantis to have gone under? Apparently so, because we, if we look at the evidence, it could not have been back at that time frame. So apparently he was misinformed. He should have written 9,000 lunar cycles before his time. Therefore, he would not appear to be misinformed as badly as he is with his 9,000 solar year before his times a rendition that Atlantis went under. So we gotta look hard at lunar cycles, and with that, Plato looks like the legitimate, fantastic scholar that he should rightfully be. The submerged megalithic ruins of the Gibraltar area, as well as those off Egypt, Lebanon, Greece, India, and Japan, should be more fully investigated. But clearly, mainstream scientists and historians have shown a reluctance to do so, because they would have to rewrite their chronology of ancient history. These offshore sites were obviously the port cities of the ancient Atlantean civilization, which clearly flourished during the Ice Age whose navigators measured and thereby mapped the Earth with astonishing accuracy. 
using the precession mapping methods used by Atlas, the founder of the legendary and truly historical maritime empire of Atlantis. I found in my research that the mankind in ancient times, pre the Ice Age, uh, generally travelled uh, in boats. Very violent type of environment when mammoths were running about in huge herds of, of, of giant elk and saber-toothed tigers on the inland areas. And I believe that mankind from at least 180,000 years ago lived on the peripheries of the sea. Mankind, I mean by Homo sapiens as opposed to Neathandral. And uh, they followed the um, herds as they migrated north and south in the summer. To do that, they needed some kind of a navigation. And I think, going back, that they probably made their boats similar to the Irish Curra. So it was able to travel in very shallow water and also sail at sea using the oars as sculling methods for getting up the estuaries and at the same time as using the oars as keels very much like the idea of the, the Dutch keels on their shallow boats. And I think that they migrated like that, north and south, depending on the seasons. And in doing so, they had to know what the seasons were. And so in a shamanistic, animistic way, they took images that they saw in the local surroundings and projected them into recognisable constellations in the sky. They did that really so that they could pass on to the next generation a recognisable way of understanding what stars were in the sky during what season. The procession of the equinox is also known as lunisolar procession. It really is, um, I suppose from a modern ast astronomical point of view, is the gravitational pull of the Earth, uh, sorry, of the Moon and the Sun on the Earth's equator, causing a wobble, a little like a falling top, if you like. Um, there are uh, other views on that um, because nuclear magnetic resonance could have a play uh, in the sense that uh, atoms uh, process around a dipole. So there's a possibility of that as being at least part of the answer to, to why we have things like global warming and changes and, uh, and so forth. So procession of the equinoxes is also a, 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 a thing that comes about where the sun um, moves uh, within the, the constellations along the ecliptic plane at the spring equinox, but also so do all, all of the other equinoxes, solstices and so forth, it, it moves. It moves at the rate of uh, one degree every 72 years. To find longitude uh, requires an instrument that can measure the angular difference between the motion of the moon and the fixed stars. When the moon travels retrograde at the rate of half a degree an hour. And so if you have a fixed object star in the sky that you can measure the angular difference against, if you also have an almanac that says at zero degrees longitude, um, you should be able to, the, the moon should be, for instance, half a degree from Venus. And then you measure it at, at midnight and you find that it isn't half a degree from Venus then the difference is your difference in distance on the Earth's surface, but it's a lot more complicated than that. You need to use Draconis, or the dragon, the serpent, in the Northern Hemisphere to identify your local midnight. And that really is the key. It's as simple as that. There's no need to keep universal time. There's only one instrument that can do that, and that's an instrument that can take horizontal uh, angular measurements to at least three arc minutes or less. Uh, because the Earth spins at 900 nautical miles an hour at the equator, um, then it, it actually spins quite a distance and at the equator it's 45 nautical miles uh, over, that, over that space. So that's quite, quite a distance and not very good for, for, um, for finding your longitude precisely. But 45 miles even in itself at the equator is a remarkable achievement. And the ancients could do that simply with a plumb line and a scale. The Egyptians weren't necessarily great seafaring people, but the Phoenicians were, and I believe they traded, and they had a lot of trouble with the sea people. And certainly the Chinese were capable of it, and there's a thought that they crossed to America, or across the Pacific a long, long time ago, before they withdrew into themselves. Um, the Celtic peoples um, were, were good, the Solutions, 
um, or the Silesians, I believe they're called, they were great coming forward. The Romans, they think that there's Roman ships off South American coasts. And uh, uh, right forward um, to the Vikings, which really were the so-called serpent people thrown out of Northern Ireland that ended up in Scandinavia and came back to rape and pillage all over Europe 300 years mm -hmm. later. Uh, difficult. It uh, goes right back to Neolithic times. I think it's one of the areas most underestimated in human development um, where they feel that we went to sea later in life. But in fact, I feel it was the other way around and looking at it, they were hunter-gatherers. And then after the end of the Ice Age, they were forced to settle down and farm because of the shortage of food. And so they carried a lot of that stuff into the farming and I st still think we live like that today and we still see the symbology of it. I'm not convinced that civilization is the right word. Um, certainly for those places where they would have settled and traded, one would expect them to be at least 300 feet below the, the surface of the, of the sea at its present level. That's because even now we settle and trade from river mouths. It, it, it's a natural place for us to be. Um, so most things that would have been left over would be would be tend to be under the water. But again, back to civilization, I really don't think that we had until we took up agriculture a concept of countries as such. And I think we tended to migrate very much like the birds do, and following the herds and so forth. And in fact, there's indication of that. You can you can see that they call themselves children of the earth, and uh, it was children of Geb and and so forth, way, way back. Civilization, not necessarily. Certainly closer to nature, and perhaps in a little traveling in family groups uh, is, is a way to look at it. Uh, but in terms of a concept of land ownership and cities and uh, that sort of thing that civilization brings up, or high technology, I think that that's, that's not the way it was. I feel that what actually happened was that these people had a, a land which was bounded by the sea as opposed to bounded by the land. So living on the peripheries of it, they were able to, and there's great evidence of this in terms of uh, Clovis points and so forth, and the ideas of diffusion and people walking across land bridges and covering great vast tracts of ice to get from one place to another. They didn't do that. But they followed the trade routes of the trade wind, trade wind routes as we know them today and the local Atlantic currents and they traveled around the basin of the Atlantic Ocean. And so they existed on the peripheries of France, of Britain, of Scandinavia, and then down the coasts of Spain, round the north coast of Africa, across from the Cape Verde Islands to Canaries, to the northern parts of America, the Caribbean, and back round the route again up from Newfoundland. And I think this is where the anomaly comes in when you see the Vikings um, still making that, or recently making, supposedly making those trips in pre-Columbian times from Greenland, um, from Scandinavia across the north coast of Scotland to, to uh, the tip of Greenland and then into the Newfoundland area, was that that was part of an old route. And if you look at it from a sailing point of view, the currents and the winds make it very easy to do that in the seasons. Top of that, is the remarkable amount of similarities of findings. Although they're separated by time, we have serpent mounds in Scotland, gigantic, and serpent mounds in Ohio, gigantic, similar sort of things. Stone circles, henges, further south, pyramids, again separated by time, so that the Mayan and the Aztec and the Inca pyramid type constructions are much later than the constructions of the Egyptians, but I, I think what we're seeing here almost is a, a different kind of humanity, a kind of humanity that was traveling as opposed to one that had settled and created land ownership and agriculture. In terms of advanced navigational system, I recently worked, watched a documentary on the Ospreys traveling from Martha's Vineyard um, to the Caribbean. And that was very interesting to watch this documentary because the parents don't show them how to, to migrate. They just get up, get out of the nest, and then they fly south. And they come to Cuba, and then they jump off from Cuba across 300 miles of open ocean. They can't see the other side, so something in their genetic instinct and memory um, teaches them that they can do that, drives them on. 
And I think that coupled in, in ancient mankind, you, you find that amongst human beings now, some are great at orientating themselves in the middle of New York or London, and others don't know which way is up and which way is down. And so there's this ability to orientate, coupled with knowing what the stars are doing by recognizing the stars, which we often put to many animals as well. And then coupled with simple, very simple, but very skilled tools um, to be able to, to do that. And I like the concept that that leads on to where uh, I think it was Plato who said that, uh, that time and me that measurement and, and number came from the time and the stars. I can't remember the exact quote, but it created philosophy and was one of the greatest gifts given to man by the gods. In a lot of ways, it, there's a lot to be said for development, um, but then there's also things to be said for cycl cyclical events. And I'm not convinced that humankind, per se, in the modern days, is Darwinian, in a Darwinian fashion, progressing. I think that a lot of people say, oh yeah, sure, we're progressing. We must be progressing because look at our technology. But then I ask a lot of people, what did you invent? You use the technology, but it's a very small group of people that actually invent those things that move on. People who don't kind of use their minds and create new things or rediscover old things generally say, well, mankind's progressing on the efforts of other people rather than in the development of their own minds. And I don't think that was the case for the ancients. I think that the ancients had to survive. They had no cushion. They, they couldn't float around, you know, using other people's um, um, skills. They had to do them themselves. But it was a matter of pure survival. It was life or death out there. And, you know, very small groups of people traveling around the world, free, sure, um, but without the kind of medicines we have now, apart from herb stuff and so forth, uh, but without a great deal of other human beings around. In other words, it wasn't a crowding for space. So progression is very difficult for me to come to terms with in terms of what I observe of humanity as that it is progressing from um, being less intelligent to more intelligent. I don't actually see that. I think the use of the human brain uh, by our ancestors to create incredible things like the uh, Great Pyramids of Giza or pyramids anywhere, which we can't replicate today, no matter how the people try to get together and do it. But they don't have that dedication, they don't have that focus, they don't have that strength of mind, they don't have that higher sense of purpose that these teams of people in those days put together to achieve these things. They were a great celebration of the philosophy of life, if you like, as Plato called it, which is a very interesting word because philosophy comes from serpent knowledge, sophis, and, and, and that is the serpent knowledge was the knowledge of order and chaos. Um, we see it in British symbols of two adders fighting and uh, the one is chaotic and the other is creative and that's the forces of the universe, order and chaos. And that was what serpent knowledge was and the ability to survive was to stand between those two forces. There are many different kinds of units of measurement. It's certainly true to say in the Great Pyramids of the, the pyramid complex, as opposed to thinking about them in terms of just being tombs, but an actual complex, um, then you see numbers um, which are related to the stars, are related to the rotation of the Earth, and related even to the latitude. Uh, multiply the 180 degrees of each face of the, 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 each pyramid of the complex, and you'll come up with um, a figure indicating the latitude of 30 degrees, roughly, um, of where they are. But not in terms of latitude as we know it today, but as distance around the Earth in arc minutes. And yet also you see the same number coming up of the circumference of the Earth in arc minutes at the equator. And then you see the rate of, um, of the precession of the equinoxes, 25,920. And that's in there. And all of, these, all of these simple things show that these people were measuring the size of their horizon, if you like, meaning time zone, related to themselves and to the stars as an exponential form of, of, of measurement. 
if you want to talk about why they measured it and what, why people were called rulers, okay, and, and this is very interesting because the idea today of, of the concept of rulers is not what it was. When we were at school, we used rulers to measure things, and that's what rulers were. They were measurers, and they measured in Egypt particularly um, using a thing called a reed or a rod, which is a measuring rod, which comes from a reed which is broken into little segments. Um, they would measure the fields after the, the Nile washed them away every year. But it was the, the, the pharaoh's responsibility um, to do that. So that there was a taxation to be formed on it, but also to be able to make sure that there was no disputes between people about wh whose fields were what and what size they were. So they were the rulers and they, they did the measuring. So it comes from agriculture. But, but measurement also comes from trying to find your way around um, deserts and, and seas, okay? But measurement also comes around uh, at a much higher level in terms of predict the future. Uh, again, those forces of order and chaos which, with which you try to balance between the two to survive, um, if you could create a prediction in a cyclical term, that would come about. So where would that be? Well, when you plant your, your crops and when you harvest your crops, and the Egyptians had three seasons and further north they had four seasons, all based on equinoxes, solstices, what position the sun was in the sky and what energy was coming from the sun. But it goes on from there, and measurement goes on to the measurement of solar energy in the form of money. Uh, um, and, and how much is, is, a, is a piece of, of wheat worth? And, piece of wheat that somebody had grown. Well, what they saw was that it, came, it was pure energy from the sun, and that that came down onto the earth and was created to wheat, which made bread. But if you wanted to trade X amount of bushels of wheat, what was it worth against a pair of shoes or a half a sheep or, or whatever? So money was formed. But if you look at money, then it was created originally out of gold in Mesopotamia, places like that. It's also circular to represent the sun. And in a lot of those countries that had royalty or still have royalty, then the representative of the sun was on one side, the head of the queen or the king, and on the other side was the signs of the zodiac in docks around the outside. So, and measurement in a grid form. Now, it's true to say that the Egyptians worked in units of 10, they used decimals. But there's great argument about whether they went into fractions or, 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 or so forth. Or, if we go back to the figure pi, you know, into the unlimited um, um, figures that are involved in pi, uh, you know, where they, they, they can calculate it to X amount of distance, uh, infinity, if you like. I don't think so. I think they'd worked on a very practical basis. I think the pyramid probably could have been built as a reflection of nature, but it, there are a lot of... Um, of researchers out there that argue about whether it was 51.8 degrees or it was 50 degrees or it was meant to be 52 degrees. The perfect form is 52 degrees um, to make a, a sphere in terms of the angular slopes. Uh, but it's built in stone and we can't replicate it today so it's, it's quite remarkable that we should not be able to replicate it today yet argument about, uh, argument about fractions and uh, whether it was 51.5 or 52. If you go for what's more likely, it was 52 degrees, because 52 degrees on the slope incorporates pi in the golden section, and if you double it, it squares the circle. So there's all the Greek problems that came up 2,000 years later solved in one stroke. For me, I've proved for myself that by using a very simple instrument that's become a religious icon, I can measure precession within at least nine years. And so okay, I could be a genius and I've, I've invented something that's never been seen before, or I could have just rediscovered something that the ancients used, which is that accurate. Now, I can make this instrument that I've rediscovered as accurate as one arc minute. In one degree, there's 60 arc minutes. And so one degree is very small uh, in terms of, of most... Uh, uh, of most instruments like a protractor and so forth. You, most protractors you have at school are only one, uh, one degree wide, 60 arc minutes, very tiny measurement. But I found out how they developed into making an instrument, I believe they developed into making an instrument that is accurate to at least one arc minute. Certainly on the instrument that I've got that I can show to you is three arc minutes. And three arc minutes would allow anybody observing the procession of the equinoxes to figure out the rate of movement within a period of nine years of observation. 
I think that um, they were able to measure the rate of precession with the instrument that I've rediscovered. And I think it has to do with something known as astrology, which most scientists back away from, quite rightly so, because it's become a pseudoscience. Uh, astrologers do not observe the stars. Uh, they use uh, Greek charts that are 2,300 years old, instead of going out like a proper astronomer and, and observing for themselves. So it's become a pseudoscience, but astrology means astral logic, logic of the stars. It really means mathematics, logic of the mathematics of the stars. And so, yes, I do think so. And I think that they created what was known as the Great Year, which is in, in, in many cultures, 25,920 years, which is once one roll of the procession, if you like, one orbit of the procession. And um, that they broke them down into 12, and 12 is the zodiac signs, and each of those is 2,160 years long. Now, again, a lot of people turn around and say, well, there were 13 signs, or there were 12 signs, or they found a new sign. Uh, or the Greeks didn't use the same signs as the Egyptians or the Mesopotamians. The point really is that the um, constellation signs of the zodiac are for recognition, so each culture would use that which was in its local surroundings um, to create a, a zodiac sign. And that's true even today. Southern Hemisphere constellation, I think there's one called the typewriter. Because what we do to recognize that group of stars is, is make an image uh, in the sky, and that's what they did. So yeah, they had uh, great ages, hence the age of Pisces, which is still going. If you do real astronomy, you know we're still in the age of Pisces, although half the world or three quarters of the world in the Western world thinks it finished in the millennium. But the Christian sign of the fish and the hat on a pope or a cardinal is a fish's head to sign for the sign of the fish of Pisces. It was only Constantine that changed it to the cross um, as a Christian symbol. But prior to that, Amen, Amun, that which is called at the end of the Lord's Prayer by Christians is, is, is your kingdom come on earth, Amen. But it actually stands for Amun, Amon. It's the um, god of time of the Egyptians, which is Ares. Uh, it's 2,160 years long. I reckon to have started the building of the Great Pyramid. So they're a very complicated subject, this, but in, in, in terms of why um, Akhenaten fell out when he said the sun was God was because the, the priests of Amun thought that time was God and there was a pantheon of times in terms of the zodiac signs these were the gods and so when Akhenaten said what he said uh, created Amarna and so forth and started the monotheistic uh, religions uh, he was quickly overthrown or he disappeared and uh, went back to uh, the idea of a moon, a man, a moon. Why, why are we saying that? Well, because we also know that the Egyptians didn't use vowels, so you can make it a man or a moon if you wish. But we also know that science and religion were in conflict 200 years ago, and the church refused a lot of these things to be, to be done. It's very much like, like that, I suppose. Tragedy, really. It didn't start out as a discovery for the cross. My background's in navigation, or part of my background's in navigation. I've also been involved in architecture, and so has my family, and design. Uh, but that wasn't what interested me. In my spare time, because I'm quite successful in business, and I, I have spare time, in my spare time, I was really wanting to find out the answers about global warming. Now, this is so far away from, from ancient stuff, it's not true. In some ways, except that it's come around as a full cycle. So I wanted to find out about global warming. One of the things I was interested about global warming was could it be caused by changes of latitude shift of the Earth or the processional precession of the equinoxes. So I studied a lot about global warming and I studied Milankovitch cycles and so forth. Just curiosity, and I heard uh, that the Great Pyramids of Giza were misaligned by around about three arc minutes. And I thought to myself, perhaps there's been crustal slipped, much like Hapgood thought when Einstein supported him as, a, as an idea, and that that would have made differences in terms of latitudinal heating and cooling. So I set out to do it, and then I set out to find out if there had been a movement of the crust that would have moved the Great Pyramids way back in the 90s, this was. And it came across my mind at the time that there was 
that there was a lot of angles in the pyramids and that they were aligned to the stars. And people are saying they were aligned to Orion. I think it was Robert Baval who said that. And, uh, and then also there was Kate Spence from Cambridge University who had brought up a subject that there was alignments with the polar stars. And I thought, well, it isn't satisfactory. I need to find an instrument that acts as a theodolite or a sextant, a, an instrument that can measure angles to allow them to make such a remarkable and accurate building that was aligned to stars. Well, I think the evidence really is from the Dead Sea Scrolls as the Essenes um, measured the lunar calendar. Um, I think that basically is it. But if you go back to Egypt, then obviously we talk about Thoth, Thoth meaning wisdom. Um, and he was also god of the moon. So we can see that he involved himself in weights and measures and writing and language and all of those things. And it also says he involved himself in the moon. So one assumes that it's pretty um, uh, split to only consider that they would measure the sun and not the moon or, uh, you know, measure the stars and not daylight. I mean, you know, they would measure everything and it says so in, in, in their books. Um, so measurement of the moon is uh, the only instrument, is the only body in the sky that's retrograde at a, a rate that's measurable by the eye. Venus, they talk about, it's not measurable by the eye. You can't find longitude with Venus, although many people have said, well, perhaps they did. You would have to be uh, into some kind of extraordinary technology and it wouldn't be worth it. The moon is the only body that moves at the rate of 30 arc minutes towards the east in the opposite direction to the rotation of the stars as they settle in the west. And it's 30 arc minutes in an hour. And so what you need is an instrument that can measure 30 arc minutes in an hour or less. Uh, and, that, and that's what this instrument does that I've discovered. It measures uh, down to as little as one arc minute and I can demonstrate easily to three arc minutes. What they're doing is measuring the difference between the moon and a star, a fixed star in a constellation. Latitude's really important, okay? The reason latitude is very important, a lot of people don't realize that not into astronomy or into navigation, is that we have only had the pole star Polaris since the 14th and 15th centuries where it's become a true pole star. And what happens is when a pole star moves into the celestial pole, which is the north pole of the Earth, as it moves in, it spirals in out of a mess of other stars. And then over a period of time, it spirals back out again. Now, Polaris will never be a true pole star, even though it's not at its closest point yet. It'll pass away um, in another 20 or 30 years. It will start to move to its closest point and away again. There has been no pole star in the Northern Hemisphere and since Alpha Draconis. And Alpha Draconis was in 2800 BC. Now, it strikes me as very coincidental that we have this amazing upsurge in technology in ancient Egypt when there was a true pole star for a period of short period of time and then another upswing in um, technology and awakening and curiosity in the 14th and 15th centuries. That I find very interesting but in terms of finding latitude using a pole star um, by angular measurement there was no way that that could be done during the time of the Greeks. So they needed a much more complex form of geometry to find the celestial pole. But it can be done using the sun or anything on the ecliptic at night by, as long as you know what the angle of the ecliptic should be at that time from an almanac. I think it's very important, the story of Atlantis, um, is that it reveals a flooding. Um, and in searching for things that are missing. And that comes back to the thing that's very important to us right now, and that is the changes that are happening on our planet in terms of the weather. And then there's the argument that our ancestors would have said it was a cyclical event caused by the sun, which is what they did say if you read the ancient books properly. So what they said is the sun caused the great flood and the melting of the ice caps and the sun is still causing, or could be still causing, um, flooding and global warming today. 
And I think from my point of view, from what I've learned about how our ancestors went, we are arrogant beyond belief. Hey, how you get yourself a scientific instrument? Aren't you? Crude. Now this instrument here is accurate to three art minutes. Now you figure out that it comes from a wheel, okay? The idea is it comes from a wheel. Now this is 90 degrees in a wheel. And so the wheel would be too big and too cumbersome. So what they did is they reduced the wheel down into a simple measuring rod using an exponential scale. So that what happens is as the plumb line whoops, travels along it, it lines up with all the degrees. So what we have here is 90 degrees. And from this part to this is one degree. Just going to open that out a bit. Do you see that? One degree. So we have 45 degrees along here. And as we tilt it, then what happens is the plumb line travels along the degrees measuring the angle. How do we measure with it? Then we have two ways of measuring. One is to okay. one is to measure along the crossbar in this fashion, and when the when it settles down, it'll give the, the measurement. And the other measurement. You want to photograph that as well. There's <laughs> a, a wheel in the middle of this square. And the other measurement is to be able to measure the angle of the slope on the pyramid of the gate. And that's to take a horizontal measurement. What they did with the, the legs of this and why I've done that that way is that that's equal to one degree on there roughly at about this level. So if you sight the moon or the sun through it, that's half a degree. Which is the width of the sun and the width of the moon on the ecliptic's half a degree, which is why you get eclipses. The line down there, you take it out to there and then put dots on it back up to that degree, you increase that to 40 arc minutes. So like a vernier scale. So the whole idea in the ancient measurements was it was always showed zigzags for seas or serpents, snakes, you see? Simple measurement. If you do astrology, um, which the Mesopotamians did before the Egyptians, you must know that the earth is round, otherwise astrology doesn't work. So if you have a sun sign, a birth sign, that means that the constellation is behind the sun. And if it's behind the sun, you can't see it because it's daylight. So you can only see the constellation opposite in the night before, at midnight. Therefore, you have to know that the Earth's round. Now, the Greeks knew the Earth was round 2,300 years ago. We only lost it in Europe in the Middle Ages. Islam knew it was around 800 AD. And in fact, I believe in this auspicious place, there is a museum to that. Let me show this for you. Okay. So what we're doing is we're taking this wheel balance in the sky. It, balance it. Can you that see that? Picture. Yes. Okay. Okay. That's that's what happens as the sun goes, as the Earth spins around, and as the Earth uh, orbits around the sun, then the sky and the stars move. So the ancients represented it here with zodiac signs into 360 degrees. So if you look at the north, this is a solar symbol. And these are the signs of infinity of the cycles, okay? And this is the fleur de lis, which is used on all navigational charts for north in ancient times. So what happens is, as the Earth spins, then every night, 15 degrees, the stars in the northern sky spin, okay? That's how they go. So as they, and, and as the, the Earth goes around the sun, and what happens is it passes through these star signs, Cancer, Aries, all the way through. 
Okay, so that's what that is. That's a, a computer model of the sky. And then this, this divides it into the seasons. But it goes further because this is a weighted wheel, which is ideal for sailing. You can measure the angle of the stars with it by looking and sighting along the crossbar. And also you can measure the angle of things in this direction, horizontally, and through these, these holes. Now, it was, all of this was carved like this, all the symbology was carved into it to say it was about time and the stars, and that's what it was all about. But really, what you're looking at as a modern instrument, to bring it right up to date, is a combination of all the things that everybody uses at school, which is a round protractor and a set square and so forth, with a weight on it in 360 degrees. And so you can sight the angles of the stars, and you can design buildings, and you can measure horizontal angles. Hmm.